So I think we should start. My name is Tore Scotland. I'm from Oslo University Hospital, and I'm pleased to share this uh, section. Uh, it's called Entry of Nanoparticles into Cells, Mechanisms, Consequences, and Challenges in Reaching the Target. And the first speaker is uh, Kirsten Sandvik from uh, Oslo. Uh, uh, and she has exactly the, the title I just read. <coughs> if I can get my first slide up, please. Yeah. So, as you see, I will talk about entry of nanoparticles into cells. And uh, you may know that most particles with drugs need to be taken into the cell by endocytic mechanisms. So it's, of course, important to focus on the different endocytic mechanisms as well. So now, oops, sorry. Um, nanoparticles use several mechanisms of endocytosis, and they can even induce their own uptake. So they are taken in both by clathrin-dependent and clathrin-independent endocytosis. It can be dynamin-dependent and dynamin-independent. And as here indicated, macroprinocytosis and forms of endocytosis resulting in smaller vesicles. And of course, they are then sorted to different in, uh, internal destinations in the cell. And uh, mostly people look at non-polarized cells where you, in addition to clathrin-dependent endocytosis, have the possibility to be taken up from caveoli by CDC42-dependent uptake or macropinocytosis, but actually what occurs often in reality is transport into a polarized cell, which is even more complex because clathrin-independent endocytosis can, for instance, on the apical side, be regulated by a number of factors, as here indicated, whereas they may not affect clathrin-independent endocytosis on the other side at all. And in some polarized cells, you have caveoli, for instance, on only one side. It's a challenge to study which endocytic mechanism is involved in uptake, since there are several interactions between the different endocytic pathways. For instance, there is a co-regulation of caveoli and CDC for the two-dependent fluid phase uptake by phosphocaveolin. So, for instance, if phosphocaveolin increases, that can increase the caveolar uptake, but at the same time decrease other types of fluid phase uptake. And if phosphocaveolin goes down, for instance, after knockdown of caveolin, then one get, may get more of CDC42-dependent uptake and fluid phase uptake. And more recently, it was reported that another caveolin uh, associated protein, cavines, they can also affect CDC42 dependent pathway. So one has to be careful. You may try to uh, affect caveoli, for instance, but you may also affect other uptake mechanisms. And as I mentioned, particles can induce their own uptake and induce intracellular changes due to multivalent binding and cross linking of proteins and lipids on the cell surface. So if you come with a ligand that gives cross-linking, you have a challenge compared to just studying the single ligand. For instance, some years ago, we found that uptake of ricin B, which is monovalent by itself, but when, when coupled to quantum dots, then it induces a macropinocytosis-like mechanism that you don't see with the single chain. So apparently due to cross-linking of a... Uh, binding sites at the cell surface. And as here illustrated, cross-linking of glycolipids can also change membrane curvature. This is Shiga-induced tubule formation published by Römer and co co-workers in Nature some years ago. So you really affect what's going on at the cell surface. And not only membrane invagination can be changed, you can even induce like calcium fluxes across the membrane when you cross-link a lipid like GB3, either by adding Shiga toxin or antibodies to GB3, you will get sick phosphorylation. This is a small kinase. And you can get dissociation of a complex containing annexin A1 and phospholipase A2 
the phospholipase A2 becomes free and can induce tubulation and membrane changes inside the cell. And of course, then this may itself affect transport in the cell. This just shows how you can get intracellular changes by cross-linking GB3 with Shiga toxin. Here is annexin A1 in green and the lysosomal marker LAMP1 is in red. And this is a control cell. After cross-linking at the cell surface, you see bigger vacuoles and relocalization of these proteins. And to optimize delivery, people often ask which endocytic mechanism is involved in uptake of a given particle. For instance, is cholesterol involved and what does this tell us? Then it's important to remember that there are several mechanisms which are cholesterol dependent and when you use cyclodextrin to extract cholesterol or the tyrosine kinase inhibitor genistein, these are not specific inhibitors for cavioli, although one can often see them used as that. They do also affect other transport mechanisms. And in order to try to help investigators not, uh, not usually studying these pathways, we have made a toolbox some years ago with pharmacological inhibitors and membrane effects and pitfalls. And here you have, for instance, cyclodextrin, which extract cholesterol, but which affect also macropinocytosis and clathrin-mediated endocytosis in addition to cavioli. And when using such a drug, one also has to be careful not to extract too much cholesterol, Otherwise, you may get leakage of potassium and even proteins if you do it too drastic. So this shows that cholesterol can affect clathrin-dependent endocytosis, that you can have uh, shallow pits, more invaginated pits, almost pinched off pits, and in, so you have these structures. And in a control cell, you have a lot of number three, which is this one, but if you extract cholesterol, you get mostly flat clathrin-coated pits. So you really affect that pathway in addition. And also, as I mentioned, you can affect macropinocytosis. This is membrane ruffling uh, and macropinocytosis studied by the enzyme HRP, which gives black staining in this EM. So here's a control cell, small endosomes with black staining. You can induce ruffling by adding the 4 ball ester TPA. You get formation of big vesicles then. But if you extract a little cholesterol first, you can see now the cell can't ruffle anymore. So you inhibit macropinocytosis as well. And also, particles may end up in a different location than the free ligand. For instance, transferrin Q dots are endocytosed via clathrin coated pits, but they do not recycle. We do not know why whether this could be a size-dependent process. And Shiga toxin coupled to a Q dot does not go to the Golgi as Shiga B normally does. We don't know why. And also, the particles may affect other pathways in the cell than those they use. It could be due to trapping of membrane. So how can man, one make sure that a given ligand or nanoparticle is internalized by the cell and not only absorbed to the cell surface? There are several possibilities. One can use EM with serial sectioning, EM with fixation in the presence of the diruthenium red, or confocal microscopy with set stacks. And I can see I have to fly through those examples. Here is fixation in the presence of ruthenium red you get the labeling of the surface, but also labeling of structures which you otherwise might have thought was inside the cell. And this is confocal then with set stacks. And uh, of course, if you use microscopy with the new te techniques now with a really high resolution, you will be able to see, like in this case, a lysosome with particles inside. Then you know they are there. How can they escape from lysosomes, these particles? Well, there are many suggestions to try to help. Not everything seems to be very efficient, and especially not in vivo. I will show you one example, photochemical internalization, that we heard about in one session earlier today, too, with the 
porphyrins and light. I won't talk about proton sponge effects or other suggestions, but just show the principle of uh, photochemical internalization where you have a drug, a photosensitizer, the, the target inside, and the drug is taken up by endocytosis, and uh, then you shine light on uh, the vesicle and the cell, and that will lead to disruption of the membrane, release of the drug, and it may find its target. So, what I would like to stress is that it's important with cell biological background to draw the right conclusions, and in order to do that, then it's very important in this field with interdisciplinary collaborations, which are then essential to come to the right conclusion. And uh, we have a poster because I'm heading now a national competence building project in Norway when it comes to uh, degradable nanoparticles. And I will then end by just showing a group picture from last year, but with Marcena uh, Schwed inserted here since she's uh, working on nanoparticles on an EU project, an Inno Indigo project. And she's here. I saw her somewhere. So that is my last slide then. I won't go through the collaborators, but say thank you for the attention. And thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. One minute left. <laughs> no, <laughs> one, one minute and three minutes for yeah, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, you were mentioning uh, of uh, toxin that can induce curvature, and you were mentioning that particles can induce something like that. Have you have evidence? Uh, could, could you see that? We haven't studied that uh, on the EM level with the particles, but what we can see is that like rising B can induce this macropinocytosis like uh, process which can then be inhibited by a sodium proton exchanger and that type of uptake you do not see at all with uh, just rising B. Thank you. Yep. So can I ask a difficult question? If you take 2D nanomaterials, graphene, graphene oxide, can they get across the membrane without an endocytic uh, mechanism? That I don't know. We have never looked at that. More questions? Yep. Thank you. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, do you know a little bit more about um, where these nanoparticles then are in the cells? How that's, what's their long-term fate and how this depends on the endocytotic mechanism? They certainly go to endosomes and uh, lysosomes. And as I indicated, um, even small nanoparticles, we have not seen that they go to the Golgi apparatus, at least not when they are coupled to uh, the toxins we have used. Why they don't go there, we don't know. I mean, in cell culture, we have not been studying uh, uh, long-term effects, but I mean, we do see these side effects even after relatively short time with Q dots. I mean, we have now started to look at degradable nanoparticles, but we haven't really seen whether they affect Golgi transport, for instance. This is something we might do. Time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very nice talk. Um, just how, how many flattening, flattering coated pits did you have compared to the non-flattened one? in the same sample. Did you do some stereological analysis? We haven't really looked at, you mean, if the nanoparticles themselves affect the cluttering coated pits? Yes, or? because it could also be a cutting artifact. Yeah, or how did you prove that the, the you have this slide, this EM, where you oh, have oh, these flattering, yeah, yeah. Coated, flattering coated pits? Yeah, yeah. That was done by EM, and then everything was quantified by EM by Bo van Ders in uh, Copenhagen. So he really counted everything on the cell surface and quantified it. So there you, th that's a solid quantification that they do become flat. And um, I mean, the same year, there were a couple of other publications getting to the same conclusion. So I consider that as a solid result. Okay, thank you.